Okay, well, I'm finally here, and uh, I'll just jump in and start doing something. Let's see what happens. This is one more of those uh, those sketches that um here I've gotta I've gotta get something. It's a nicely drawn sketch of, uh, of a fairly dull pose. Um, so, um, I can at least feel uh, free to to do whatever and not feel like I'm really going to screw it up because it's kind of a uh, it's kind of something I've got no use for anyway. Um, and by the way, every now and then, I, I'm not the only person on earth that does this sort of thing. Uh, there's other people that will do a life drawing and turn it into something else. Uh, sometimes even kind of a fantasy thing where they might just put her on a beach or uh, something. Um, but, uh, uh, and because some people do that, there are, of course, some people who criticize that. And they're going, that's not what life drawing's about, you know? And, well, I think we're all perfectly aware that that's not what life drawing's about. Um, while I did the drawing, while I was in life drawing class, I was doing what life drawing was about, and I was drawing, I was learning. Practicing. But at this point in time, all that's left of that experience is a piece of paper that I'm either going to keep or throw away or do something else with. And uh, that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm deciding whether or not I'm going to keep it or, or do something crazy with it or, or just toss it out. I might do anything of those things, but, so, uh, so even when there's a boring pose, it's not a tragedy, I mean, you know, I still get a drawing session in, um, if the pose is really kind of unusable from my perspective, sometimes I'll just draw a foot, a hand, a face, um, you know, it's still, it's still a useful thing to do. So when I say something is boring or it's not useful or something like that, I'm not criticizing like the model or the guy directing the, the class or anything like that. I'm, I'm just talking about this piece of paper that I have before me at this moment in time. And questioning whether that has any value to me. Uh, as a fantasy art guy. Well, that's disarming. And, uh, she's looking over here, so it doesn't seem wrong to have her hand doing something over here. I don't know what. Um, she's certainly not doing anything violent, not punching anybody or uh, you know, shooting a gun or anything like that. She's just kind of looking over there. 
you can be gesturing, pointing. Holding something in her hand.
Uh, Victor says, I really enjoy these drawing lessons and hearing your stories. Oh, well, I'm, thank you. And I'm sorry I'm not telling any stories. I, <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I'm late and kind of preoccupied and, and uh, uh, I almost didn't show up. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, um, I'm liking where this is going so far. It, it, when I moved the arm, it, it already just became a much more interesting picture. You know, she went from, you know, this to, I can't pantomime it. There's, there's only like two feet from my, <laughs> from my camera to my paper. Um, it, but uh, anyway, it, it, the whole thing took on some action um, and uh, became a much more visually interesting thing uh, the second that happened so that was that was good gave me a bunch a much different attitude towards the towards the drawing because I was ready to go yeah I don't care if I throw this thing in the trash to tell you the truth but uh, now I do now I think it's good and I want to keep it so um uh, had zero caution at the beginning. Now I'm starting to have a little bit of caution because I, because I'm going to start to care. Now yeah. that's good and bad. I got wondering what was the status of COVID vaccines and uh, went and read an article on it. I guess I shouldn't have done that. It was a very encouraging article. I had lots of great things to say about very promising studies and things like that, except that it was identical to an article I had read last March, you know. So, um, uh, <clears throat> That kind of bummed me out. miss my drawing class I don't know what I would do if they if they announced that they were opening one back up I mean, part of me wants to say I'll I'll just go um, but I don't think I will
I just saw a piece of uh, fantasy art done by somebody, I don't know, who uh, online, and uh, they'd drawn it really well. It was a interior scene, like a tavern or something. A person wearing clothes, had some jewelry on, weapons, and a bunch of uh, like glasses and and dishes and stuff on the shelves behind them and uh everything was realistic except all the stuff that needed to be shiny like metal and glass and ceramics and stuff they had done with really soft edges like uh, uh like that's how they were handling shiny was to make it soft so uh, like all these things look like they were made of uh of uh, plush toys you know <laughs> it was like i don't know it was uh anyways that's not how you do soft uh how you do uh it's not how you do shiny things um things that are reflective are reflective because they're hard they get a very hard surface and the light bounces hard and it and it's you got hard dark shadows and hard bright lights um you don't make it soft and fuzzy um uh sharon says hi i got my retirement gifts today they're so cool i'll post pics later uh 3 30 meeting postponed so hi oh excellent so um yeah you're like you're like at the very end aren't you you're like you're like there isn't it like tomorrow sharon's retiring i'm gonna say tomorrow maybe today uh she'll tell you um but yeah congratulations I mean, it's probably nice when the company gives you a watch or something, but um, that's become so, so cliche. So it's cool if they're giving you better stuff.
when I left Better Built Aluminum, um, my coworkers had presents for me. Um, the, the company had nothing. <laughs> the company was just, uh, you know, after years of being crappy to you, they're just like, mm, why are you? Why are you leaving? <laughs> why would I stay? But I did get neat stuff from from my coworkers. I want to say they weren't a bad lot. They were. They were terrible. But uh, the co-workers, I mean, um, it could be decent when they wanted to. They, uh, every now and then something horrible would happen at work, you know, or, or at to somebody at work. Uh, Somebody's house burned down one time. I remember that uh, somebody had been in a somebody had been in an accident, and uh, I don't know. It found out one time that somebody who'd been working there for a while was was living in a tent. Um, they had a wife and a kid, and uh, and so. You know, the people went around and, uh, you know, took up a collection and, and actually got them into an apartment. And, uh, and uh, or, you know, when the house burned down, you know, we got donations of stuff and money and, and stuff like that and helped the guy out. And, uh, you know, that was pretty cool. Uh, but the company itself, yeah, my God, they were terrible. And, and they didn't do any of that. Um, it, we found out, I won't even try to tell you this story because I'll get it wrong. I won't even remember it correctly myself. But suffice to say, we did in fact find out that <clears throat> there had been a fund coming out of our checks since the beginning of the company for that kind of thing and um you know it's just part of you know in, instead of going to insurance or retirement or, or whatever there was there was a, a fund for things the employees need you know to help out and um and it turned out that the personnel manager who was responsible for handling that fund um, was just putting it in his bank account and keeping it. And uh, <laughs> when somebody uh, blew the lid off of that and took it to the to the president of the company, he said, uh, "Well, he does a good job." <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> And uh, the the money continued to come out of our pockets and go into his. I mean, from where we stood, we were never aware of that money to begin with, but it was just the knowledge that the guy was stealing it from us. And then the company, like, okayed it. Uh, Sharon says tomorrow is last day, technically November 1st, but that's Sunday. We had an award catalog to choose from. There were watches, but I picked our air fryer, toaster, rotisserie oven, 
These are from the department and much cooler than a watch. Yes, definitely. And we're all carrying a timepiece anyway. Yeah, so who needs a watch? Um, that's very cool. Very cool. Um, you were talking about your air fryer. So, so Stellar bought one. So, uh, I don't know how it compares to yours, but, um, I just heard her say this from the other room that it's the same one. So, um, I guess she didn't want to be one upped by you. So, so we've got an air fryer, which we have so far used twice as a toaster. Um, but we'll be trying its other features soon. We had an old Black & Decker toaster oven that was, I mean, it still got hot, you know, I mean, you could, <laughs> you could turn it on and it would get very hot in the side, so things would toast or burn or whatever, but, um, uh, it was kind of, uh, unpredictable. Ah, to put clothes on her or not to put clothes on her? That is always the question. What will I do? You'll love it or the food from it, at least. I'm sure I will. Um, yeah, I'm becoming rather a fan of food. A little too much. Should back off on that a little bit. Ah, she's in the forest. She's sitting on a log. She's talking to a bird. Or maybe she's flipping the bird. But then, uh, what else is going on? What else is happening? Is she... A priest? Is she a warrior? Just a Disney character. Do I give her a long dress? Overalls. A spacesuit. Do you have a sword? A machete. A wizard staff. Maybe the bird is part of her staff. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm going to back off until the letters stop being fuzzy. 
I have cooked a rotisserie chicken, baked enchiladas this week so far, and I'm cooking a pizza in it tonight. That's John. All right. Um, in case you missed it, instructions say keep it five inches. Inches, I think that says from the wall. About feet. I don't have to keep it five feet from the wall, right? And uh, yeah. Yeah. Inches. There it is. There it is. Um, She's got it more or less where that toaster oven used to be. Um, so I think it's fine. I guess I'm not using that one. Well, a chemise, a chemise. I have to go Google it. And see what it is. I think it's a, a undergarment, or it's a dessert made with cherries. I'm not sure, but I like the second one. That sounds really good. A chemise. I'm gonna go bake myself a chemise. I'm sure she's going to wind up wearing boots. I should probably just go ahead and put boots on her. I mean, it's kind of inevitable. Mark says a chemise flambe. Um, and John says it's a short, thin, teddy nightgown thing. Okay, well, I'm liking the sound of both of those. Um, maybe Stellar will wear a chemise and make me a chemise flambe. Just don't wear one of those polyester ones and light yourselves on fire. A little safety tip from your Uncle Gilead. By the way, these uh, 
these boots with a little fold down top. Um, there's a reason for them, and that's because they fold back up, or at least the original ones did. Um, usually, if you bought it in the mall, it probably doesn't, but um, uh, they were they were often something that you could unfold and be knee high or thigh high uh, boots. That's just a little piece of trivia out there. John says my great grandfather was a custom British riding boot maker. I'll be damned. Did you know him? Is he still making boots? Um and uh and uh yeah, that's pretty that's pretty darn cool. I presumably had a great grandfather, at least one, maybe more than one. And uh, I know nothing, I know nothing about them. That's not entirely true. They were farmers, <laughs> as were their great grandfathers and their great grandfathers before them. And none of them had any money. Sometimes I've used a really nice piece of paper and I've done a really nice drawing and I still want to put a costume on it and I don't want to scribble around even with the fine charcoal which wipes off fairly easily because it's still going to muck up the drawing to one extent or another. And what I'll do then is uh, I've bought a, a pad of tracing paper the same size as this and I'll put a sheet of tracing paper on and then take my vine charcoal and play around with different uh, with different designs until um, uh, until I come up with something I like. And uh, so I, I'm not that invested in this one still, but I still don't know what direction I want to go. And there's there's stuff. Chemise is French for shirt. Okay, I buy that. Um, uh, didn't meet that grandpa, met another grandpa, okay. Clearly not United Labs approved. Um, I don't get that. I don't, I don't get that. Um, but, uh, that may be all I've got. Be all I've got. Uh, Earlier in this video, Victor said he enjoys my stories, and I had none today. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't actually plan. Uh, I don't plan these at all. Um, <laughs> I, sit, I sit down, and uh, I start drawing, and what I'm drawing reminds me of something, and then out comes a bunch of bullshit that I had no idea I was about to say. But there it is. Um, there it is. And uh, it's been 40 minutes. I could tell you a story.
I want to hear a story. Who wants to hear a story? Raise your hand. I could save it for tomorrow. You could just remind me tomorrow and say, tell us a story, kid. And uh, maybe I'll have forgotten the story I was going to tell. Um, so yeah, it's been 40 minutes. I'll uh, I'll uh, drop it here. And um, I believe uh, Victor says that's the best. Um, yeah, what, making it up on the fly? Or uh, probably. Um, cool. Yeah, um, I'll uh, I'll come back tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> Sharon's raising her hand. Okay, all right. I'm gonna tell a story. I'm gonna tell a story. First, I'm gonna turn on my fan because it's hot in here. <clears throat> I didn't think that was gonna happen. It was freaking cold this morning. Um, the last few mornings, it's been shockingly cold. All right. When I was 10 years old, um, it was abruptly announced to me that it was my job. Um, it was my job to mow the lawn at the church. Like, really? Oh, <laughs> I don't know. So from between ages of 10 to 18, it was my job to mow the lawn at the church. So I would push the lawnmower you know, with a handle up here, you know, because it was bigger than me. And I'd push it down the street and I would mow the lawn at the church. And I also mowed my yard and the couple ladies in the neighborhood who couldn't do stuff for themselves. And and um, so I wasn't getting paid for that. I was just doing it. And and um, so I'm down there at the church and I'm mowing lawns. And, and little by slowly, other people in that neighborhood started asking me if I could mow their lawn. And so I picked up about a dozen regular jobs that I went out and did every week. Um, you know, at, at 10, 11, 12 years old, um, you know, and if I got 50 cents for that little lawn and $2 or $3 for this bigger place, you know, for a 10 year old in the seventies, that was actually pretty damn good and uh, so uh, so I was doing a bunch of places and then this couple came up to me and they said can you mow my mom's lawn um, and, and they wanted me on as, as a regular you know a weekly thing um, the the old ladies uh, the old guy had died and the old lady didn't know how to didn't have a lawnmower didn't know how to do yard work she was too frail and so okay so I, I picked up another job, old Victorian house uh, down kind of in the neighborhood of the church. So um, so I did that for, I don't know, a year, maybe two. Uh, so I don't know how old I was during the time of this particular story. Twelve, give or take, um, a year. Um, so, so, yeah, I... I was doing this lady's yard. She loved me. The couple, they lived in Phoenix, but they would come up in the weekends and, and they, they loved me. Everybody thought I was great. And they, they did such a good job. All praises, just praises. Every time somebody saw me, just praise, praise. And then uh, one time, I, uh, John Mode Lons of in the 50s and 60s for two dollars and fifty cents a yard so you had higher cost of living in california i don't know i was probably just underselling myself um but uh one day i was i was working at this lady's yard and we were going out of town and i wasn't going to be back for like a, another week or something like that and i i told her i said you know we're going to be gone for a, a week or whatever but you'll be the first place i i do you know when as soon as i get back she said that's fine okay well i realized i had to push the mower and also i had to carry some other tools of these uh hedge clippers and pruning snips and stuff like that and uh that was really awkward and i, and I just said 
this is the next place I'm going to be using these tools. I could just leave them in her garage, which is right there off the alley. Uh, but I pushed the lawnmower home. And um, so I pushed the lawnmower home. I left my a, a couple other tools in the garage. And so a week later, I come back and the young couple is up from Phoenix and they're doing something in the backyard and I come strolling up and they looked at me and they were like huh, like this and then and then they were kind of like they they like freaked out and and then they and then they said you do a horrible job you're you're just crap every it's, it's always been crap you know we, we don't want you around here anymore and they just like tore me at your shreds and you know it was just like Whoa. and I was a pretty I was a pushover back then and and it was pretty easy to knock around so i was just kind of like well i'm sorry and i left and my tools were in their garage and uh and i was just you know thinking well, it's not fair and and all this but i wasn't gonna go back you know and so well of course they were my dad's tools um so i had to go back so i was like well, what am i gonna do and so I decided, you know, to do the only sensible thing, which was to come back at one o'clock in the morning and steal my tools out of this garage, which was never locked. So it wasn't a difficult thing to do. Um, so here's the setup. On the alley side of this garage, there was an old carriage door that rolls sideways on wheels on a little track, like a little tiny railroad and that had not been opened in 100 years okay weeds grown up over it and and, and stuff i was half buried um, on the on the alley side um they hadn't hired me to fix any of that but i was actually working on it i was actually had had the garage partly excavated from from its years of drifting uh, dirt and everything but i hadn't finished that part so um uh, on the front side, there was just a regular door, and then next to that was another regular door that went into an add-on thing that somebody had made, and it hadn't been opened in probably 50 years. So this this one door opened regularly, um, and then, like I say, it was always unlocked. So I snuck down the alley at 1 o'clock in the morning, jumping at every sound. And I got to the garage and I snuck around the garage to the to the front, which is the, the in the yard facing the house, you know, so I was scared and trying to keep to the shadows and you know uh you know and, and get over to the door. And there's a brand new shiny padlock and a big hasp on the door, which had never been locked before. And I was like, well, dang. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, okay, that door isn't going to open. The, the carriage door isn't going to open. That left this other door on this little add-on, which had a window on it, and it was broken. And you could theoretically reach through the broken window and undo the rusty hasp and possibly wrench the door open so i decided to try that and i stuck my arm through the through the broken glass i was moving very slowly so i didn't cut myself and something very large got up and moved inside the the garage and i freaked it i, I pulled my arm back out and the thing whatever it was ran to the back of the garage and started slamming into the carriage door i mean body slamming hard it was it was a large body um and just bang 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 practically you know just shook the whole structure and uh so i ran away and uh so the question has always been what is smart enough to be scared by a person's arm reaching through the window, st 
stupid enough to body slam a door that's never going to open. Um, and makes no noise, made no noise whatsoever. No cry, no whine, no growl, no bark. Oh, and is locked into the garage from the outside with a brand new lock by some people who, in hindsight, weren't angry when they saw me. They were scared <laughs> when they saw me because it was more like, oh shit, I forgot about this kid. And, uh, and, uh, I was about to walk in on something. And, um, as an adult, of course, I know you've got to go call the police and tell, tell that story. But I'm sorry, when I was 10 and I was going to get in trouble for being out of the house at one o'clock in the morning, much less anything else I was doing, um, <clears throat> I kept it to myself and didn't tell anybody. <laughs> and I still really don't know, but the mind reels. All right. So uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Bye-bye.